All right. Hi there, everybody. I'm KP. I work at the Austin Music Foundation. I hope everybody is doing well. We are on the up and up. Live music is coming back and it's really great to see. So thank you for joining us today and welcome to the InSync Pitching Music uh, pitching to music supervisors. Really excited about this workshop today. And so I just wanted to um, say a little bit about AMF before we get started. For those of you that don't know, we are a 501c3 nonprofit arts organization, and our core mission is to strengthen, connect, advance the local music industry and community. We do this through our educational programming, like this one tonight professional development focused mentoring with our one on one consultations. You all should sign up if you haven't already and networking opportunities. We were established in 2002 and remain one of the city's only service organizations dedicated to delivering year round music business training at no cost to the local music community. It's actually going to be our 20th uh, anniversary next year so it's going to be a big deal we'll be ramping up for that and uh, we're really excited that we've been around this long in Austin so for more information about our programming and to get involved please check us out at austinmusicfoundation.org so we're really looking forward to the workshop tonight and the panel discussion hosted by Natalie Fan of SoundSync Music the session will begin with an introductory workshop where we will discuss best practices for pitching your music, followed by a one hour panel discussion with music supervisors, Kirsten Higuera of Deep Cut Music, Livy Rodriguez Beha of Dreamboat Music, and Sammy Posner of Creative Control Entertainment, and moderated by Natalie. It's an amazing female lineup. And uh, we're really excited to have them on board today. We will do our best to cover all your questions you submitted in advance, and we'll be taking questions from the audience throughout the panel. Feel free to leave your questions in the comment section of this feed. And yeah, we'll, we'll be reading those all throughout and are gonna do our best to try and answer those. This event is also in part supported by the Cultural Arts Division, City of Austin Economic Development Department. So big cheers to those guys, a little shout out there. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our host for the evening, Natalie Fan. As a values oriented leader born and raised in Houston, Texas, she has made it her life's mission to put Texas musicians on the map. In 2015, while still a digital media management student at St. Edwards University, she founded On Vinyl Media as an umbrella organization for her many creative ideas on building and sustaining a local music ecosystem and local music industry infra infrastructure. One of the businesses under the umbrella is SoundSync Music, a boutique sound design agency that licenses local music to both indie filmmakers and large production houses alike. Pretty amazing stuff, guys. In her official capacity, she has led and participated in workshops, panels, and university guest lectures on entrepreneurship and music licensing. We're really proud to be working for working with Natalie and SoundSync Music in delivering education to our community. So that's it from AMF right now, and I'll let Natalie take over from here. Good to see you guys. Hey, thanks so much, Kate, and thank you uh, for the rest of AMF. I'm really thankful that uh, despite how poorly things went last time. <laughs> <laughs> you are uh, so They've invited me back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so the uh, I've spoken a number of times before. I've participated in partnership with AMF to do these webinars and I'm really grateful to be back again um, on this hyper-focused uh, panel and workshop on pitching to music supervisors. Uh, again, my name is Natalie Fan. I'm a sync agent and the owner and operator of SoundSync Music. Uh, I've given this talk about a hundred times in a hundred different ways, but this time I'm really, really honored to be joined by Sammy Posner, Kristen Higuera, uh, and Livy Rodriguez. Um, three really wonderful and talented women. Um, we'll hear more from them after the workshop portion of this talk, which will be only 30 minutes. You know, you don't, you, you can't really tolerate me for more than that. So uh, <laughs> um, I will go on tangents here and there. So I apologize in advance, but I hope that everyone is going to have a great time. And thank you for all who's 
who are tuning in today, um, despite there being a Black Puma show, I think that we're going to have a great turnout. Uh, we had a lot of RSVPs this morning and over 160 questions. of some of the ones that I've handpicked for this panel. But of course, there will be opportunities to, um, to ask questions at the end of the workshop. And then uh, at, after the panel, I'm happy to connect with anyone who shoots me an email. So uh, we'll just get started. I only have 30 minutes to try to do justice on this very important topic of pitching. Before I do begin though on, on the content, I, I do wanna say that this is the second time that I, I've worked with AMF to deliver this content. There are a ton of things that you need to know before you even get to the part of um, how to actually pitch. Uh, have your metadata together, know the differences between your masters and your publishing. All of this information is really important to know. So before you get started, please do your research, please educate yourselves on um, just industry topics that are important to know before you get to this. And you can always go back and watch the first one that I did with AMF uh, a couple of months ago. So before we get into what you should do, let's get into what you shouldn't do. Um, first of all, don't buy email lists. Don't ever uh, send attachments unless they're asking specifically for attachments. Um, always link to your music instead. And there are a couple of different ways you can do this. I like to use uh, service agnostic platforms like Disco, uh, which was pretty much built for pitching um, your music. There are also platforms like SoundCloud that don't really require a sign in. I don't really like to assume people use Spotify because I myself don't use Spotify. Um, I will accept, you know, pretty much anything that I can log into. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, I, I would know when and how to follow up, never spam with follow up emails, don't use samples or cover music you haven't cleared, that's super important. Again, this is all just a recap of stuff that I've covered before. Um, so I'm going to try to glide over some of this stuff. Uh, but it is really important to make sure, for example, not to pitch to music supervisors if they don't accept submissions. And if they say it on their website, you should probably take that seriously. And uh, don't use these phrases, you know, avoid phrases like I have the perfect song for you. To me, perfect is sort of a taboo word. I don't think that there's a perfect song for any sort of situation unless it was scored for the um, for the show itself. Uh, I would stay away from the word perfect also because this, you know, music supervisors have the most difficult job in the whole world. It's to make a good match, a good match between the scene or video that they're working on and the song and create something that is you know, completely new. If you've heard me talk before, I'll, I will talk about how music and film apart, they're two separate art forms. And when they're put together, there's a synthesis that happens um, in sync and uh, you'll come out with a brand new product. So they have this extremely difficult job that they have to work uh, with under a certain deadline. They have to work with a lot of different people, producers, directors, etc. And so using the word perfect to me, I, I kind of avoid that in my pitch emails. Did you get a chance to listen to my music yet? Uh, that's probably not a good follow up to your first email um, because they, you know, music supervisors in my experience are very busy people. They generally get a lot of submissions if they do accept submissions. And even if they don't <laughs> accept submissions, they're probably inundated with them anyway. Um, so I would, if I was following up with a music supervisor, probably include something uh, that is new, some new information, new songs, um, maybe, hey, I saw a piece about you written in this magazine, you know, just share new information. Uh, I have a song called Deep End that would be perfect for your show, Deep End. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a little tongue in cheek, so I would stay away from stuff like that. I'd love your feedback. Also, I don't think 
the back. Um, what are you working on? That is a big no-no to me because I feel like you should already know that before you reach out to the music supervisor. So something that we'll talk about next is gonna be research, research, research. That is going to be the most important thing that you do before you even start typing that email. Uh, can I be added to your search list? And this is you know, something that's a little taboo because you don't, first of all, how would you know if they had a search list? And if they did, you know, they would add you to it if they really believed in you um, or, or felt like this needed to be shared. So that's something that needs to be unsaid. Um, overall, I would avoid these phrases. There are a lot more of them. Um, I'll make this deck available to you. Uh, and hopefully, you know, there are a lot of different links that you can click on and make sure that, you know, you find some of the Easter eggs that I've dug in here. All right. So the most important thing that you should do when you reach out to a music supervisor is to do your research. Um, there's no golden ticket to a sync license. There's no easy way into it. It's It just takes a lot of practice, research, relationship building. Um, so my first piece of advice is to get on Twitter. Um, for whatever reason, there's a large community of music supervisors that are on Twitter. Sometimes that's a really great way to connect with them. At the very least, you can see what they're tweeting about, um, what projects they're working on. So it's, it's just a really good way to see uh, firsthand uh, what they're tweeting about and, and what projects they're currently working on. Second piece of advice is to personalize your message. No one likes to be sent just canned messages. I don't think any of us like to be sent that despite me not being a music supervisor. Um, I think that personalizing your message is gonna be the most important thing that you can do or one of the most important things. Um, you're really looking to stand out. So an introduction, then the best thing that you can do for yourself is to, you know, talk about the re some of the research that you've done. Are you a fan of the show? Have you even watched the show? Um, have you uh, looked into what types of uses uh, traditionally or historically the show has had? Uh, what types of artists or what songs have been placed? What's your fa favorite placement from that show or your, that film? Um, if you're using IMDb Pro to find contact information, make sure you're not contacting their agent and make sure that they accept submissions. Find out what shows supervisors are currently working on, but understand that on IMDb, it might not be up to date and make sure that the shows aren't canceled. So again, just stressing research, research, research. Again, there's not like really a, a simple and easy way to get the attention of a music supervisor. I think it just boils down to how well can you make that introduction and how well can you uh, get their attention by really personalizing that message. Okay. All right. Okay. So a tool that I really love to use is TuneFind. It's a really simple and easy way to that's historically show way is to get involved with the Guild of Music Supervisors. They have people in and licensing in general, which I highly recommend networking with as many people in sync as possible. Uh, you can attend industry conferences like the Guild of Music Supervisors Conference or Sync Summit, or there's like a handful of uh, conferences that are hosted by the PROs. Um, we'll talk more about the Guild of Music Supervisors with Sammy later in the panel portion of this event, and hopefully she can tell you more about GMS. Next, uh, metadata and organization. It really is super important that you know metadata and you know what rights you have. Uh, so I would brush up on copyright law. I would brush up on how to keep everything organized in Disco or whatever platform you're using to organize your discography. 
music supervisors are high stress people make their job easy for them have all that information there don't make it hard for them to find your contact information always have that contact information embedded in the metadata of your song make sure that your metadata is airtight licensing is in a field that you can participate in if you don't have attention to detail skills I like to use tools like Airtable and Disco to manage your metadata and your music catalog. You can organize your catalog so that songs are easy to search for. Uh, again, I'm going to I'm not being paid by Disco, I promise, but it is one of my favorite platforms to use for instances like this, where you can tag songs with different taxonomies. You can color code things now. It's a new feature that they just rolled out. So it's it's a really great having uh, music files and having all that metadata, met metadata there for you. Uh, next, include keywords to help music supervisors search for your music. Um, include lyrics and genre. That can be helpful as well. At least have it on hand if they ask for it. Next is include lyrical themes and moods include all basic information such as contact information would be, I, I would argue the most important thing. Uh, who the other songwriters are, PRO affiliations, publishers, IPI numbers, obviously your title and the artist of the song, just basic information. Um, I would argue that, you know, contact information is 100% most important thing that you should include in there. I would also say it's an order is super important as well. If your rights, if, if um, that pi doesn't equal 100%, if it equals 99.999%, that's not good enough. We need to have 100% to use that song. So for clearance purposes, make sure that you have all of that metadata, all of your rights in order, um, split sheets on ready. You know, I love when artists have split sheets already um, there for me because that makes my job a lot easier as a sync agent and it certainly makes clearing the song a lot easier for the music supervisor. Phrases like one stop and non union um, know what those mean. One stop and truly only use them if they're true. Um, to indicate that something is one stop, it basically just means that you have uh, the rights for both the masters and the publishing um, or pre cleared those rights. Non union means exactly that you're not part of a union. This is this can be an advantage because uh, oftentimes unions have pretty high sync fees. So if you're a non union artist, then that means you're a little bit more budget friendly. Um, it's not always necessary, but I do know that a couple of music supervisors that I've connected with uh, can't afford to pay union fees sometimes. Okay. Uh, consider getting an agent. It's easier said than done, but if you're a composer, you can find an agent to represent you and find you work. If you're in a band, you can find someone like SoundSync. Um, or a publisher that's willing to do some of that work for you, licensing representative. I will say that the reason that I'm having this workshop in the first place is because there's no way that I can represent all the artists that I love in the, in the entire universe. You know, um, oftentimes sync agencies are either small independent boutique agencies like SoundSync or they are larger entities that are a little bit more selective. Um, either way, you know, it's it's hard to find an agent, and I understand that. So, the reason why we're doing this is so that you know exactly what is going on when an agent is pitching on your behalf. Know that you can do this as well. Um, a lot of supervisors do like to work through an agent, but if you are a savvy independent artist and you can show that you have your metadata together, you know exactly what your rights are, you know the differences between masters and publishing, you can furnish those rights um, or that information to music supervisors easily. You know, you are building your reputation as a trusted source. That's really important as well. So know that you can do this if you're talking to the right supervisors um, and if you know what you're talking about. 
All right, so what I'm about to show you is exactly, exactly how I send cold emails. All right, to music supervisors I haven't met before, if I can't get an introduction, this is what I would do. So pitching strategically, again, emphasis on research. Best, best way to familiarize work is to list their work in films, TV shows, ads, etc. Take that time to really look into um, what they're working on. You can also use TuneFind to quickly gauge whether the show historically relies more on score or on song placements. You can look at all of the songs that have been synced in each of these episodes. Um, observe what types of uses there, uh, or what kind of uses the, the songs are serving in terms of purpose. What is, um, or how is the music contributing to the scene or episode or the advertisement? What is the function of the music and how does the music supervisor like to use that music? And what artists have they synced in the past? So I use what's called the artist. Uh, step one, you're just going to find artists that sound like you, that you would describe yourself to. And oftentimes um, with the artists that I work with, this is a very difficult thing for you to do to compare yourself, especially if you think that you sound like a, a mixture of different artists, but you're gonna do your best. You're gonna find three to six artists that you sound like um, that fit your vibe as a musician or as a band. Step two, you're gonna do research on placements that these artists have had in the past. And for each of these placements, step three, determine the following. What type of media was the placement? Was it a film, TV show? Was it a game, was it an advertisement? Um, what genre is each artist you selected? Which songs were placed in which media programs? What genre is each media program? Was it a drama, comedy, reality, TV show? Um, who were the music supervisors and or music supervision company for each program? And then step four is analyze any trends that you notice. Focus on pitching based on those trends. And I have a couple of useful tools here. Music map for finding artists that you might sound like. Um, Tune find, IMDB, Wikipedia is great for research. So I'm gonna walk you through those steps, you know, one by one. So the first step is you're gonna find artists that sound like you. So I have a uh, artist X here, fake artist. I just listed a couple of different artists that I think um, artist X sounds like. So Kehlani, Normani, her, uh, a ton of different artists. And I'm gonna create a map out of this. All right, so artist X sounds like, and I just listed two because I'm not gonna do all six. Um, Lauren Hill and Caliucci's. If you search on Tune Find Lauren Hill, um, Miss Lauren Hill, you're going to find placements that Lauren Hill has had in the past, and you're you're going to reverse engineer this process, right? So you're going to find shows or that Lauren Hill Caliucci has had in the past, and you're going to find. Um, a couple of different shows. These are real shows and these are real placements that these artists have had on these shows. I censored the music supervisor names because it's really not important who the music supervisor is, uh, although it might be, <laughs> although, you know, a lot of people might recognize some of these shows and know immediately, right? So you want to get to that point where you can actually recognize some bigger shows. And again, um, it doesn't really matter that these shows are big. Uh, I would even say if you're just starting out, go for go for some lesser known uh, shows. For this purpose, I'm just putting some popular TV shows and, and films that people might be able to recognize. Okay, so you're gonna build this map, Artist X, Lauren Hill, Caliucci's, and you're gonna see all the shows and you're gonna find out who the music supervisors are. For this particular map, you're gonna see that there are trends right? Lauren Hill's been on um, Being Mary Jane and Queen and Slim. They have the same music supervisor. Also, this same music supervisor supervises Insecure. Uh, Euphoria is supervised by a different music supervisor. And you're going to analyze what trends you, you see on this map. 
four out of four of the programs were dramas, three out of four of the programs were TV shows, three out of four of the programs were music supervised by um, a music supervisor, uh, the same one. Four out of four of the programs had strong black female leads or characters. So you've done this research, you know this, um, you might wanna look into these TV shows or the film if you haven't seen it. And you wanna analyze the uses of the, of the songs. So I'll do another example here, Artist Y, sounds like Fiona Apple and Shaky Graves. Um, we'll see Handmaid's Tale, Mr. Robot, Fargo, Brave New World. These are some, some of the targeted shows, right? They're all TV shows, they're all dramas. Three of them, out, three out of four of them were music supervised by um, music supervisor X, right? right? I bet supervisor might be. Uh, but the trends in this example, four out of four of them were dramas, four out of four were TV shows, three out of four of the programs were music supervised by the same person, two out of four of the programs were produced by the same producer, two out of four of the programs were crime dramas. So you're basically just creating trends. And based upon these trends, you want to find um, a similar show, right, that fits this profile, find another drama, TV show that was music supervised by um, this music supervisor that you've, you've seen here. So music supervisor X, whoever that person may be. Two out of four of the programs, again, were produced by the same producer. So does that producer like to work with a certain person? Does that director like to work with a certain person? So there are trends like that. Um, and then two out of four of the programs are crime dramas. So again, you're gonna wanna go for dramas, crime dramas. So that's the sort of reverse engineer process that I use for SoundSync. And, um, you know, I wrap it up neatly in this person where the subject line can be something like, sounds like artist X, artist Y for whatever show you're pitching to. If you know that that show is going to be renewed, right? Um, best time to probably pitch is going to be pre-production or during production kind of depends on the show. Uh, obviously if it's true if, if it's easy clear then say easy clear um, but also be sure that you know how to clear it okay uh, so this email just starts with hi whoever the music supervisor is I'm and then whatever your name is an independent artist who sounds similar to Lauren Hill and Caliucci's. I saw you work on a lot of dramas that have strong black female leads such as Insecure and being Mary Jane and have used music by both Lauren Hill and Caliucci's in your projects before. If you're ever looking for anything similar to these artists, please let me know. I've made a disco playlist for you here. You can link to your playlist. Again, I would use an, uh, a service agnostic platform and I'd say something like if you're only if you only listen to one song, I recommend the first song on the playlist titled whatever the song is, and then describe the song briefly. Thanks for your time, sign off, and send that pitch. Um, so it's a lot of work. You have to do a lot of research. But I think that you know the more research you do, the more personal you get, the better your chances are. Again, it's not like a one and done sort of deal. Do it over and over and over again. Get as much practice as you can. Um, things to mention. Uh, specific character names, specific usage comparisons, uh, why you think the artist or the song would be a good fit, certain trends or artists or genres that you've noticed. Um, just really do your research <clears throat> and really personalize that message. All right, I'm going to do a quick five minute Q&A. So pop your questions in the chat or um, email me and we'll get those questions answered. Then we'll introduce our awesome, wonderful, and very generous music supervisors uh, who've decided to spend the next hour with me despite the evidence. <laughs> um, so we'll get those folks introduced and let's take some questions now. All right. Okay, let's see questions. I don't know if I can see the chat actually. 
Oh, here we go. How often should we follow up with music supervisors? Can you explain disco? Okay, so the first question, how often should we follow up with the supervisors? If you're an independent artist pitching for yourself, I would only follow up with them once every, uh, I wanna say like two months. And I know that seems like a long amount of time, um, but really you can send an email to a music soup and the chances of them responding immediately are gonna be pretty slim. Uh, it might be, I mean, I've heard of soups pulling out emails from four years ago and trying to contact the artist. And again, this is why having that contact information is so important when you send people songs. Um, so when you do send songs out to music supervisors, just make sure that you are, um, you know, including that contact information and including maybe five to 10 songs. I think 10 is a little much, five might be better. You can all and that's your best bet. Can you explain Disco? Disco is a platform, uh, an Australian based company, I believe. And it was basically, it's basically like Box or Dropbox, but specifically for music and for uh, music metadata. Okay. Is it a problem if the playlist on SoundCloud is private? Um, only if they can't access it. You know, I don't think that having a private playlist that they can't access is very useful, but as long as they can access it without having to log in, I think that should be okay. Um, what if you are an artist that has music in multiple genres, do you create a sampler with it all? So this is a good question because if you're an artist, I would want to build a niche. I know that there are very talented people out there that can do a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. And your need you want to make an impression uh, if you need some. I think maybe that rule, if you can play it a ton of different genres, but um, if you're making like lo fi 80s esque music you know, that's probably a really cool niche that if I ever needed that sort, sort of music, I'm going to go to that person for that music. Um, as an agent, do you pitch multiple artists in one email? Um, I sometimes will mix and match it up depending on what I'm pitching for, um, depending on whether I'm responding to a search or a brief, or <clears throat> if it's a cold email, then I might, um, it, it depends on the, on interested I'm interested what is a search list a search list um, is a list that some music supervisors might have uh, when they reach out to different agencies or maybe even artists it just kind of depends on the music supervisor some supervisors don't use search lists can you tell us five of your favorite sync agents <laughs> besides yourself Oh gosh, that's a really hard. I don't. I don't want to um, put anyone on the spot. I mean, I don't know if it would be an endorsement or anything like that. So, <laughs> uh, okay. Do you think that music supervisors deal with artists, or do you, don't you think that a lot of music supervisors don't deal with artists directly, as they are super busy and they have agents? Just info I've heard on Clubhouse. You know, Clubhouse is one of the those things you know you might be getting good information you might not be getting good information so i'd be careful with the advice that you're getting on clubhouse um i can't speak for the music supervisors we'll get to that in a second all 160 questions i'm just kidding um but i you know i i do think that some music supervisors may be interested in hearing from the preference of working directly with a manager or maybe an, an agent. All right, so that's as many questions as I can read. Right now there's a whole ton of them and I, I know usually these talks are like two hours long and I'm just ranting on about um, copyright and metadata and stuff like that, but it's a very, very <clears throat> hyper-focused topic on pitching specifically.
And I am so, so happy to have really talented women in the room that can help me answer some of the 120 questions or 160 questions that we've received. Um, so I'm gonna start introducing our really talented uh, <clears throat> lineup of music supervisors. So first off, Sammy Posner, she is a music supervisor. Angeles. Uh, she is a music supervisor work at a, an agency called Creative Control Entertainment. She's worked on a wide range of projects from TV and film, including <clears throat> the Netflix record-breaking film, A Fall from Grace, and live theater to video games, most recently as a licensing consultant for EA's FIFA 21. Uh, and NHL 21, Sammy's worked on Tyler Perry's latest television series, Sisters, Bruh, Ruthless, and The Oval, as well as the Nickelodeon series, Young Dylan. And she's currently working on second seasons of all of those. In addition to her supervision work, Sammy works for the Guild of Music Supervisors, managing their six craft communities and has been instrumental in organizing many of their live and virtual events, as well as helping to champion their mentorship program. So thanks for joining us, Sammy. Having me. Yeah. And Nat, I don't, I don't know who wouldn't want to watch you talk for two hours. You're just so personable. <laughs> thanks. I've been talking to my computer for way too long at this period. So I'm really happy that things are starting to kind of open up. Totally. Next, we have Kristen Higuera. She is Austin-based. Um, she got her start in advertising and audio branding. She's worked at boutique agencies in London where she helped curate the sound for global hotel chain Citizen M and in New York City where she sourced and secured music licenses for international advertisements for clients, including General Motors and Walmart. In 2019, Kristen made the jump from advertising to film and television. She's now the music coordinator at Deep Cut Music, where she has worked on The Great, which is on Hulu, Bosch, which is on Amazon, Generation, which is HBO Max, and many more. Thanks for joining us, Kristen. Hey. <laughs> All right, and lastly, we have Livy Behar Rodriguez, or Rodriguez Behar. Um, Livy is a music supervisor and the founder of Dreamboat Music, a music supervision company based in Austin, Texas. She's worked on musical <clears throat> branding projects for companies such as Disney, Warby Parker, Tory Bur uh, Birch, Target, and TomTom. Tom. Additionally, she's worked on film and television projects for Martin Scorsese, Richard Linklater, Robert Rodriguez, and others. Her films have circulated notable film festivals <clears throat> such as Tribeca and gained distribution on popular platforms like HBO. Welcome, Livy. Wow, Nat, thank you. <laughs> I could also hear you talk all day. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. All right, well, we had a ton of questions that were submitted to us, so I'm gonna throw them out there and um, I guess we can take turns answering some of these questions. They're, they're pretty heavy hitters. So uh, speaking of one of my favorite firms. So um, our first question is, how is pitching to film different than to TV? Um, I can answer that. Pitching for uh, TV is a lot faster. The chances of you missing the boat are pretty high. So unless you're really on top of your research and are for sure uh, that we're in pre-production or about to be in production. Um, I, I'd say it's 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 more it takes a little more strategic uh, timing than than for film. Film can be a bit longer. Yeah, I have to agree. There was a show that I worked on a few years ago, and the turnaround time was weekly. So we were clearing music weekly um, per episode. So next week would be another episode. Next week would be another episode. So very quick turnaround. Whereas for film, it could take, you could be music supervising a film for like a year, like I have. <laughs> um, so then you have a lot more time to sort of pitch your music. Um, and to follow up on that point, um, you know, sometimes you can have fast turnaround in film too. Let's say a director is really not feeling something last minute and 
needs something but doesn't have the budget for the something that they need um, but you have a back pocket of all the music that's been submitted to you and you know who you're going to call um, you know you're calling joey whatever at gmail.com who pitched you the awesome song one stop um, and are hopeful to clear it so that goes back to having all your metadata in place and being available and being reachable. Awesome. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. Great answers. Um, any suggestions on how to handle first contact or introductions to music supervisors? Kristen, do you want to take this one? Yes. I'll, yeah, I'll go. Um, I guess just be concise to the point, have your sub genre, sub artists. Um, I mean, music is so subjective. It really, don't expect to hear back for a while. Sometimes, you know, like Nat mentioned, it could be four years down the line, a couple months down the line, everything, everyone's so busy that it's nice to know that if we have an email to reference, oh, okay, this is what you sound like, that's good to know, let's listen to it later. So I guess that's the best way to interact. Um, I have a simple little tip. Um, I tend to not want to pay attention to emails that don't have my name on them. Uh, if Because I can tell that you've copied and pasted that pitch to a million people. If it's just like, hey, I have music for you. I'm like, no, you don't. You just have music. <laughs> but if it's like, hey, Sammy, I'm blah, 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 just like your template, then you're a lot more likely to you know, get a response or have your email read. It doesn't look like spam. <laughs> I also have made relationships with different artists. They'll send me an email that I won't pay attention to because there are so many, but then they'll reach out through. And I know people are all different about this. I personally don't mind. I know Natalie, you don't like when you're reached out through Instagram for different business inquiries. I personally am a little bit more laissez faire, like reach out however. Um, I just want to get exposed to, you know, different music. Um, but I've established good relationships with people are reaching out to me through social media, letting me know that they've sent me an email with their music. And then I'll sort of check out their social media. And then their social media sometimes gives them a little bit more credibility to me. I'll say like, oh, wow, they have really good visual aesthetic. I'm intrigued now or a really good follower account. They must have a lot of buzz. Um, so that's one way. But not to pitch your music through social media. Don't do that the kind of a friendly bump. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, everyone uh, receives music in different ways. It's just about, you know, first of all, read their website to see if they take submissions or not. And if they don't, take that seriously and don't pitch to them. Um, all right, so next question is, uh, this is a little bit more technical. Could you please discuss preferences for stems and bit rates? So this one, actually, I've received like two or three times. So I thought we might cover this one. Pre yeah, have, have, reads. oh, sorry. My, I, my internet has a little bit of delay. I didn't mean to cut you off if I did. Um, have all your stems available. Have an instrumental version, have a version. If your song is like a pop song and it has strings in it have the version where I can take out the strings have the version where I can take out the horns um just because options why not have all your options and have them labeled <laughs> bit bit rates I can't I can't speak to I'm not a music editor <laughs> all right cool thank you Sammy um, do, do supervisors listen to unfinished music? All right, so Sammy's nodding her head. Kristen, Livy, what do you say? I usually don't have the time. I'm usually, like you said, we're high stress people, like it has to be finished. <laughs> um, but I have worked with people sort of creating music from the ground up. I mean, I'm not a producer or a composer or anything, but um, actually one of our mutual friends, Natalie, um, I needed something very specific and I knew somebody with the voice, the sound, the kind of music, but not the song. And so, um, yeah, sometimes I work helping compose music for different things, but usually you want it finished because like 
Sammy mentioned, sometimes we have really short windows to work to work with. Um, not not right. just openly. Don't pitch. Don't pitch unfinished music. That's a that's a hard no. But if we're working on something and and you've already made the contact, made the connection, absolutely, it's part of my job to help you create it and finish it and make sure it's exactly what everyone wants. So a little a little asterisk there. Uh, here's an interesting one for someone in a country far away, such as this person who is from India, would it be possible to get picked up for sync not having had quote FaceTime with clients slash supervisors. Yeah, I mean, I would say um, if I were sent music from a different country, you know, usually when it's from a different country. I know that they didn't do their research because my catalog's extremely, uh, as all of you know, very specific to Austin. Um, <clears throat> but what about you guys? Um, here you go. <laughs> oh, I love discovering music from all over the world, and I get really excited when somebody reaches out to me from a different country. Country, I'm like, how did you find me? <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I listen to music from all over the world as long as they, as long as they know like who, it. and um, usually when it's a one-stop shop, it's easier for me to like pay attention to and to clear. Kristen, did you want to? Uh, yeah, we definitely listen to music from all over the world. It depends on the spot, some, and that's good to know sometimes if like we have a spot that needs Indian music, we now know someone who has Indian music. Like there's times where we're looking for like Mandarin folk from the 1980s or like recently we're looking for very specific Russian music from 1987. So that's, it's always nice to know and like have that ready. This is what it sounds like. This is what kind of Indian music it is or what regional so definitely into world music. Awesome. You never know when you're going to need it. Like there was a film that I was working on where we needed Liberian music. I was like, what does Liberian music sound like? So always open to music from all over the world. And also adding on to that, um, there, there's also all kinds of music that comes from all different countries, not just world music that comes out of India. Just wanted to add that point in. Um, period. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. So how many songs are recommended when pitching to sync? I guess we kind of already covered this one, but you know, how, I, how, what I, are you, I was nodding you know? my head. I nodded my head at five. Five felt good to me. 10 was like, mm, too many, too much work. Yeah. 10 seems a little bit much. 10 seems like here's everything I made. Here, <laughs> it's it's too much. I think three to five is a a good sweet spot. Like three, perfect. Five might be pushing it. Yeah, I agree. Three to five. All right, cool. Um, how often should they be pitching songs? If it's coming from an independent art artist, how often should they be pitching their songs? If they're not hearing back for a long, long time, then maybe not as often. I know that's kind of harsh, but there's probably a reason for it. And maybe their work then is to get some more feedback on the work that they're pitching before they pitch again. Um, if it's someone that is getting the attention of a music supervisor, um, then the roles sometimes reverse and we'll reach out to them. Um, so it, I, I'd say it really depends on, on the artist and, and on the relationship, but I, I'd, say, um, I'd say to keep an eye on what they're working on. And if you get a response saying, nothing right now, but hit me back in a couple weeks, you should take note of that. Good answer. Um, do any of you use lice or do any of any of you use covers or are you ever looking for covers? 
And if so, how does licensing covers work is the question. They're definitely a cheaper version, um, a cheaper thing to get. Um, and I love covers. I'm very partial to covers. Um, if you look at my Dreamboat music playlist, it's just all covers of different things. Um, in that case, you would have to clear the mechanical license. And so that's for people who are music supervisors. But um, yeah, what do you mean specifically? Um, more of like, <clears throat> I guess, could one of you walk us through, you know, in which situation uh, you would need a cover or if you're looking actively for a cover? I guess budget, being budget friendly or budget conscious is, is one of those reasons. Yeah, and also sometimes like showrunners will have a specific song in mind that they actually want the cover instead of the original. So that's also a possibility. Um, but I try to avoid co covers like we as a team collectively we're like eh, covers eh, doesn't excite us but sometimes there's cool ones so it really it really just depends on the project yeah i was gonna say it definitely depends on the project we run the gamut on kinds of projects um and you never know when something's gonna come up if you have an amazing cover i mean i i have a whole playlist of covers that and the thing that really gets me is if um, if you're taking something and you're just singing it and playing it the same way, but it's your voice, that's less interesting to me. That's called karaoke, which is a different thing. Um, but if you take something that's like, if you take a pop song and you play it like a bluegrass song, then I'm like, oh, that's so inventive. That's so cool. Like if you use your musicianship and your arranging skills to actually arrange it, and create a new piece from something that already exists, then then sure, if I have a project that calls for something like that and, and it's a good fit, then then it if there would and there's budget, and there's budget, um, then that would be great. If you want to go the extra mile and do your research, maybe make my life a little easier and don't cover a song that has 17 writers. Um, because then I'm like, ah dude <laughs> and like four of them are not four of them are dead and they own their own publishing and then I have to contact a weird lawyer in the middle of nowhere like just do a little bit more publishing research uh, before you choose your cover choose your cover smartly <laughs> yeah that's that brings up a point is um some songs are just really hard to clear uh, which is why I always advise well, to just a nightmare and, you know, agents probably won't take it. Supervisors are definitely not going to take it, <clears throat> at least most of the time. Um, so, so what I'm going to go off script a little bit here. Uh, what's the most difficult song that you've had to clear? Or is there a most difficult song that you can remember <laughs> it being a nightmare? <laughs> I've had two that were really difficult to clear, like one that was really painstaking, but the director was set. They were like, this is the song. It's this or nothing. And I was like, oh my God, okay. <laughs> um, and so I really just jumped through so many hoops to make it work. And sometimes you're backed against the wall. And I feel like it's those times when music supervisors really gain their stripes and they just like, they find different avenues. They're like, who do I know? Do I know the artist manager? Like I've gone through I've done some crazy things <laughs> to be able to clear music. Um, but there was this one song that was two very known people, um, a hip hop song. And so, you know, hip hop songs, they have like a bajillion writers and publishers. Um, and so that song took me about, it took me about three and a half months to clear. And that's one where I like, I reached out to the management and I reached out to the artists through Instagram and I reached out to, um, I followed up with the publishers and they were like, well, it's this amount. And I were like, but we have this amount. And then just through um, politely persisting, we were finally able to get it down um, from a very high fee to a lot, lot more reasonable fee. Um, 
but that one song took about three and a half months to clear and then the director was so happy once we were able to clear it it was a huge win for us um and then there was what was the other one and then there was another one um which which actually wasn't one of like the hardest ones i've had to clear but this is actually one that you were helping me try to find a replacement for nat which was this one song that um was very difficult to clear because they also were just very unresponsive sometimes it's not even about the fee sometimes it's just about the approval party you're not being able to get a hold of them because they're so unresponsive and so i was looking for something very simple similar comparable to the mood the sound and natalie you were kind of helping me run through a lot of different austin uh artists from your roster who were similar um but that was an instance in where i got in touch with the son of the artist through facebook and I was like, can you help me get your dad's song clear? <laughs> and um, then, um, yeah, that's how we got that one cleared. So eventually we were able to get that song placed in our film. So I'm telling you, sometimes you have to jump through hoops and do the craziest things to get the perfect song. And sometimes you can present a lot of different options for this one scene, but the director, they're so married and you, they, can't, they can't unmarry this song from the scene. So sometimes you just have to help create their vision, bring their vision to fruition. I love that topic. Um, Kristen, what about you? Oh, sorry, Kristen, the internet you? cut out for a second there. It was like, whoa. Um, we actually had a song on the most recent season of Bosch that it took me three and a half months to clear and like, it master was with a major label so I was like cool like we got the wave file this is fine turns out like they lost the it had turned out to be with the major in Japan and then like it was like a month of waiting finally they were like we lost the rights 10 years ago and we we're like oh cool like great this mixes in two weeks and so it was like down to the wire like day before mix um took calling like the art, like luckily we knew someone who knew the artist and it was like an old jazz song and long story short, it was a happy ending and it cleared and they, it was just like a renegotiating of the contract with the major label and the artist and it turned out fine. But sometimes it's just, it was a lot of persisting. Like if we sat on it, then it wouldn't have cleared. Like it was just constant calling and updates and like checking in with Japan, checking in with the artist and that was a fun one. <laughs> yeah, wow. That seems really intense, but I'm glad it ended happily. Yeah. <laughs> Sammy? Oh, sorry, Nat is frozen on my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, am I okay. still frozen? No, you're back, you're back. Um, crazy clearance story. Um, okay, so I've had similar experiences to Kristen and Libby. Um, so I'll talk about something slightly different. Um, I've had to, or we, we've had to clear arrangements of public domain songs. So, so um, songs that you'd hear in a church um, that someone's wife did a choral arrangement of in the 90s um but they don't belong to that church anymore because they moved and skipped town and so we had to call we have to locate the church is the church still standing okay great same church call the church get the contact explain that no we're not trying to harass your members we just need the contact info of the person who arranged it oh they died 10 years ago okay their third cousin owns the rights just like the craziest the craziest hoops to jump through to find the song um that that's an example of something being crazy it it did have a happy ending and i i think that's kind of um that's our job <laughs> We make it happen. We jump through hoops. You can't be shy to call people and use your network. You just can't. Um, we were we were trying to clear another song. Um, 
couldn't find contacts, lawyer was unresponsive, lawyer preferred to send um, all clearance paperwork uh, via snail mail. So we, we deal with some people like that. <laughs> so, um, you know, keeps things interesting. <laughs> Is there a support group that I should know about? <laughs> I don't know, but if you find one, hit me up. <laughs> uh, well, all right, back on script now. Let's tackle some more of these uh, questions submitted by folks who RSVP'd. Um, is it preferable to have an agent approach a music supervisor on behalf of artists? Can managers also approach and pitch their artists? I think managers can totally pitch their artists, but managers typically have no idea about publishing. So like if you're a manager, know the splits, know the publishing, know who owns what, um, and, if, and, and make sure that you are able to represent it as a one-stop if there's splits um, and you don't represent the band, you only represent one member or something. Um, just, you know, know what you're doing before you pitch to us, know what assets belong where so that we can clear it. Yeah, totally. Um, do you guys prefer, uh, I guess people have different preferences. So do you prefer, um, I guess if it came down to it, would you rather have a manager reach out or would you just have the artists reach out I guess it kind of depends on what they, they know, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Okay. Go ahead, Kristen. Oh, I mean, am I muted? No, you're good. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it just depends. It's as, as long as you know what you're pitching and who has what, it, it's kind of the same at the end of the day. Yeah, I would say I'm indifferent as long as they're able, either the manager or the artist are able to describe their music succinctly. I'm okay with either. Cool. Same. Yeah, and that can be a very hard task for some artists to um, compare themselves to artists that they may sound like, though it's an important thing to do, uh, you know, just for reference sake. All right, moving on. Is it true the more you sync, the easier it gets? I don't know who submitted that question, but um, I think in my opinion, like that first sync, you know, just is, is super important, um, having that very first one and then building up from there. Obviously the more skilled you are, it's sort of like a resume. Um, the more people you've worked with, the more shows you've worked with or gotten placements in, I think from an agent's perspective, it's, uh, it's helpful for sure. But getting that first one is really hard <laughs> so, uh, like I said, go for the low hanging fruit first. Um, there are tons and tons and tons of shows out there. You don't have to go for the hottest shows. Okay. Um, what are the best ways to keep track of music supervisors, current and upcoming projects? That's a good one. Uh, Livy, do you want to take this one? IMDB is an easy one. Just looking at IMDb, what's in, even what's in pre-production, what's in post-production, looking at what stage it's in, and then just kind of keeping tabs on that. Um, that's definitely an easy one. Or sometimes just go to the source, just make friends with filmmakers. Um, that's what I did when I was first coming on the scene. Well, besides working with the different places that I worked, once I wanted to music supervise, P films independently, not working for any larger organization or company. I would go to South by Austin Film Festival, just meet a lot of filmmakers who are just getting their start and then befriend them, follow them on social media, um, and then just keep tabs on their projects, whatever they're posting about and see if you can get an in just to get your foot in the door. Awesome, good response, thank you. Anyone have any other, uh, I guess IMDB is just like the main one. Um, I would say that, you know, not everyone keeps it up to date. So don't just rely on IMDB. 
um, Livy had some really good advice, go directly to the source. Um, network as much as possible. Uh, I know that a lot of the times music folks and film folks don't end up in the same room, although I don't know why they should, at least not here in Austin. In LA, it's like, you know, a paradise. <laughs> That's why I love going out there and visiting Sammy so often. <laughs> I love LA. <laughs> Uh, so this one me up. What was <clears throat> uh, what was the moment in film that made you realize you wanted to be a music supervisor, and why was it Tiny Dancer in Almost Famous? <laughs> <laughs> Get out! You know that's my favorite movie ever. <laughs> it really is. That's why my company is called Dreamboat. Long explanation. I won't go into it. I'll just briefly say. Um, Cameron Crowe, who directed Almost Famous, was married to Nancy Wilson, who composed the entire score of Almost Famous. She was in the band Heart. My favorite Heart album is Dreamboat Annie. Dreamboat Annie, Dreamboat Music. That's why it's Dreamboat Music. Um, but yeah, definitely Almost Famous. Um, watched that in middle school and I was like, what are Quaaludes? Um, <laughs> but yeah, definitely best soundtrack, best movie ever. That's a great story. Um, mine was a walk to remember opening scene breeders cannonball as the opening credits are rolling in and everyone's like walking from the car to that like reservoir that that guy jumps off of, which is like very on the nose in retrospect. Um, but it was just hearing can like the breeders cannonball as like a young kid. I was like, oh, this is rad, but yeah, that's what made me want to do it. Nice. Sammy? Um, I don't have like an aha moment, I must do this. And because my theory is that 50% of music supervisors um, know exactly that this is the field they want to get into and they have those references and they go for it and they're like, yes, this is my calling. And then the other 50% of us totally fall into it by accident and are like, oh my God, I'm really happy to be here, I love it. <laughs> so I. I fall into the latter category, um, actually with a music background. So coming into film was fr from, you know, the intersection of music and film. I come from a music background specifically, um, and, and finding my way into film was just a really natural fit. Um, so... Uh -huh. I don't have a moment off the top of my head. I don't have a cinematic moment. Sorry, it's very disappointing. Next time you bring me back, I'll have one. Don't you worry. <laughs> Hopefully I'll see you very soon, Sammy. And the first thing that I'll ask you is that question. You, you won't ask me because I'll just tell you. The first thing I'll say is <laughs> <laughs> Natalie, what's yours? Besides Almost Famous, do you have anything that you were like, well, I want to get into licensing? Oh, I accidentally fell into licensing. This was not something that I chose. I just fell into it. Um, you know, as <clears throat> a couple of you may know, I started off with on vinyl media and that required, um, it was a, a B2B platform where businesses could license music for commercial use in their retail stores. And having that plus radio station alma mater, which is St. Edwards University, all of the, what was at the time useless knowledge and, uh, you know, didn't really know where to take my career and decided, hey, you know what, I really enjoy film and I really enjoy music. So this is something that I want to pursue. And I, so that's really, how I, enjoy, fell into it. And I really enjoy paperwork <laughs> <laughs> and spreadsheets. <laughs> I love being the middle person for other middle people. I just love it. <laughs> Basically, um, but yeah, that's, that's, I don't have an aha moment either. So Sammy and I will work on it. We'll get back to you. <laughs> All right. So next question is, uh, why do local sync companies refuse professionally produce local music? I Take 
And so if you are from Austin, um, out some of the stuff that I've received, it's purely, you know, locally based for now. So I will say that. Um, and I would say that if you are rejected, I wouldn't take it personally. Like there's plenty of music that I absolutely love that I received that is from Austin as local. I'm sure these other ladies can um, <clears throat> can really relate to this, but you can't you can't take on all of that, you know. And uh, being like a very very small boutique company, it's hard to keep up that that woman power, and um, you know re respond to everyone who submits music. Um, so this is one that I got pretty common. Uh, should you write specifically <clears throat> for sync with the intention of getting uh, sync placements or should you write as an be syncable? Kristen, do you wanna take that one? Um, I, don't, I don't recommend writing for sync. I just think for, a while a lot of stuff sounds the same and there's definitely a place for music that is written specifically for sync but like we as a team we're not into that like we like to dig on spotify dig on just on the internet it just yeah it's you never know what spot you're looking for i mean it could be russian folk it could be like feel good rap. It, it's just totally depends on the project. So I don't recommend writing for sync. I don't feel like it's authentic, but there's a place for it, I guess. Sammy, Livy, any opinions? Yeah, I like listening to songs or I like looking for songs that are authentic and that were written from somewhere else, not with the purpose of being sync. You can connect to them more, um, relate to them more in scenes. Um, like it can be too on the nose when it's written specifically for sync. Um, but then I have friends who do write with the intention of their music being synced and they'll like write a really triumphant song and then they'll pitch it to different licensing companies, you know, and then it'll get placed in something like a, like a sports commercial. So there is a place for it, but yeah, not usually what I gravitate towards. Um, I don't consider writing for sync and other kind of writing diff as, as different animals. I think what I do consider is if you are a member of a band and you have a sound that is specific and that's your, that's your road. And if you decide to release a concept album in a different genre, then that's your prerogative. But I think Writing for sync allows songwriters the opportunity to explore different sounds. And I think artistically that can be really freeing creatively, um, especially because it might give you the opportunity to release music under a different alias. And so um, for the sake of creativity, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I, I also think good songwriting is good songwriting. If you're watching Bridgerton, and then you get inspired and then you write a song using all of the main characters names like you're missing the point you know you, that you have to use metaphor and and musical devices in order to showcase that inspiration don't be super overly literal um i've sat in on listening sessions with with music that's been pitched to me like that and it's so cringy <laughs> so you can write for sync Make it good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that pretty much nails it. <clears throat> um, uh, from an agent perspective, I'll take on uh, artists. I, I wouldn't say that there's any such thing as syncability because you really don't know until you have a project that requires a certain thing. Um, I have my overall music taste to refer back to, and then I have um, you know, if I'm working uh, on something uh, and I know that I have a good relationship with the music supervisor that's looking for something specific that my roster does not have, then that's another conversation that um, I'll have with the artist. And yeah, uh, syncability is not, I mean, 
the the thing for me is that as long as you have music that can be generally used in a lot of different ways if the lyrics aren't too specific that's like the only no-no for me don't use the main characters names <laughs> Or if you have a song that's about a guy named Apple, uh, Adam eating an apple, walking his dog on the sidewalk, you know, that's like so specific, you know, it's like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> More conceptual. Yeah. Or like the show's title. Yeah. That happens too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just corny. Right. Yeah. Don't, don't be corny. Yeah. Unless you know it's not like a great thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, can I see a placement of my music within a year? And what are the steps that I can take that highly increase the chances of it happening, given the music is great? If you get me a Tesla, we'll talk. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I, a bunch of Austin people are, are listening. So maybe someone can make that happen for you. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. It's just, it's just end of day sillies. Um. It's it's really hard to pitch for yourself. Oftentimes, maybe get with a reputable licensing company, and hopefully, it's a good one that'll shop your music for you, so that it's not just sitting there shelved. Otherwise, it's a lot of legwork on your end. Right. I think it's really hard to be objective about your own work, um, which is the other part that's challenging of pitching your own music. Unless you can be really objective about your own work, because um, the last part of that question was, and it's really good, how do you know? <laughs> Did you, you know, who, who's, who's feeding into that and, and um, showing up to events like this and networking events where you can get your music heard um, is great. And, and being able to take feedback as an artist in, in this industry is, is you, you, you can't do it without because you have, you're part of creating another person's vision. It's not your solo show, so. Yeah. Um, do you ever give feedback to artists that ask for it? Um, via email, on a cold email, probably not. I just don't have time. Once in a while I do, and that, that I know that's gonna open, it's gonna flood my inbox right now. But once in a while I do, um, especially if they're a younger artist or they're like, I'm, or, or they're in school still and it's like an internship situation where they wanna be at music supervision, but they also make music, um, then sure, because because there's a relationship there and there's more invested. Um, but, but oftentimes, you know, just cold, cold reaching out, like, can I have your feedback? It's like, what do I get? <laughs> so good. Durango songwriters exposition is a great event. They do, they just did their, um, their last, round online and so be, being able to get your music in front of music supervisors for listening sessions there are spaces where we can listen and give you feedback um so getting linked in um to those events is is important if you want feedback specifically from supervisors awesome uh all right one last question and then we'll See you later. Uh, do you see the future of sync continuing to grow in the independent market? So independent music rather than, I guess, major label or major publishers. Kristen, you look like you're thinking pretty hard about this one. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It I definitely think there's like the independent labels are and publishers are getting bigger and in indie artists like there's just so much outreach now like everything's a click of a button we can dm someone we can email someone we can find someone's like brother to message to clear a song like it's just everything's the click of a button 
but I don't know. I think there will definitely always be a place for majors and their catalogs just because that's, you know, that's just how it is. There, people have specific tastes. People want specific time, like time period catalog music. So I don't know. I feel like it's a 50-50 because on a lot of our projects, it's we do work with a lot of majors and major labels and publishers, but we we love working with indie labels and indie publishers and even indie artists who aren't affiliated to anyone. So I think it just, like most dances, it just depends on the project. Good answer. Sammy, Libby? Yeah, I think there's definitely opportunity for growth. And also now that there's more kind of, I especially think during the pandemic, things got more virtual um, panels, especially with like the Guild of Music Supervisors, things like Clubhouse, there's more opportunities for gaining musical literacy and learning how to get your music out there. And so I'm not sure if like one will outweigh the other, but I think there's definitely so much opportunity for growth for indies and independents. All right, that's that's my cue. You said Guild of Music Supervisors, <laughs> thank you. So I, <laughs> I will plug, I, I agree with, with everything you guys said. Um, and yes, the Guild has worked very hard to um, outreach uh, so many indie artists and, and boutique sync agencies and, and everyone in between uh, during this apocalypse, which is maybe coming to an end now, TBD. Um, but uh, sh should I just talk about the Guild a little bit, Nat? I agree yes. with what Kristen and Libby said. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I agree. And um, the Guild of Music Supervisors is a great place to not pitch your music. I'm just going to put that one in the front. Um, but to come and connect with music supervisors, uh, create a relationship with music supervisors, kind of be in the room with the people who you're reading about on IMDb. Um, and maybe something comes up organically in a conversation and you happen to have the perfect thing, you know, be strategic, don't be so thirsty there. Like things will happen for you. Um, but you can join the Guild of Music Supervisors as a friend of the Guild. Uh, so that's as a music maker, creator. Um, you can also join as an associate member or as a member if you're a music supervisor. Um, go to guildofmusicsupervisors.com. Ding. Um, and also, our events are very educational, just like this was. So come and learn and, and continue to, to know what to do and what not to do and how to do it and who's doing it and who's not doing it, et cetera. And sorry, one more, if you're a college student or you're interested in interning and getting into music supervision, um, I help champion the Guild's mentorship program as well as our committee coordinator program. And we are looking to recruit uh, new coordinators for these committees. So you're working with the top music supervisors in their fields um, and you're helping them with day-to-day -day stuff, month-to-month -month stuff towards the awards. You're crazy like we all are, um, but there's opportunity to get in the door with the people that are making the stuff happen. Great, yeah, that was gonna be my follow-up is how how does one get a mentor? <laughs> oh. uh, all right, um, yeah, so does anyone else have anything that they'd like to plug? Kristen, Livy, nothing? All right. All, all good. All good. Well, I wanna thank you guys again for joining me for um, you know the hour and 30 minutes that we had and it was super educational and I hope that everyone found this information to be helpful and uh, thank you all so much for joining me and it's uh, it's an honor to be joined by such talented and really busy women who should definitely support, uh, create a support group for music supervisors. <laughs> You're the busiest, Nat. You're the busiest. <laughs> all right. Thanks, thank you, Nat. Nat. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. And yeah. Thank nice you. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah. <laughs> the Exhausted Music Foundation too. Yes. Yeah. Well, shout out to uh, Kate, Jenny, and Emily for for helping us and partnering with us uh, on this 
event. Hopefully we'll do some more in the future. And if you ever want to learn more about the Austin Music Foundation, then um, please feel free to go to austinmusicfoundation.org. Also, last time that I did this, I accidentally, <laughs> I didn't expect it to be like as big as it was. I think there was like 500 people who joined. And I, um, I said that if you guys didn't, if you guys have any questions that you can email me and the next day I got like 200 emails. So that's kind of on me. Um, this time around, I'd like to do something a little bit more charitable. Everyone here volunteered their time. Uh, so if at all possible, if you can make a $5 donation to Austin Music Foundation, you can ask me any question that you want and I will respond to you. All right. Wow. So please, uh, they've done a lot for the Austin Music community. Um, a lot of great educational events, mentorship programs, things like that. So I really, uh, you know, if there was something that you just didn't get answered tonight that you really want the answer to, if I don't know the answer to it, then I will try to get that answer for you. <laughs> if you Venmo me, I'll also answer your questions. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks Thank so much you. for having us nat you guys yeah, can, I, can you. I take a quick picture of you absolutely yeah let's go okay. a little selfie all right